Uh, Ira is the Solon and Betty Gershman Professor of Colon and Rectal Surgery at Washington University Medical Center in St. Louis. He's the director of the Wash U Center for the Study of Ethics and Human Values. Ira has been a real leader in surgical ethics education throughout the U.S. and has been instrumental in helping over 45 and uh, 45 surgery programs develop teaching in ethics. Um, in addition, he's had um, leadership roles in numerous uh, colon rectal surgical societies. He's authored or co-authored over 100 peer-reviewed manuscripts, book chapters, etc. He will speak to us today about ethical challenges resulting from the stress of a career in surgery. Ira. Thank you. Uh, this is going to be a, a different kind of talk. Uh, we're starting with concerns in the delivery of health care, uh, complicated by a system where our patients purchase the cheapest health care when they're well, but they use it when they're sick and they want the maximum without regard uh, to time and cost. Uh, to summarize, uh, we wanna, they want to pay for a Kia but drive a Cadillac. No one's ever come in and said, I don't expect you to do everything for mom because I know I bought the cheap policy. <laughs> um, the relationship with our patients uh, is changing. Uh, it's one uh, from paternalism where everybody said, I'll do whatever you tell me, doc, uh, to a more shared decision making uh, to one based on uh, real informed consent. This presents uh, dilemmas, one of which is never written about. We talk a lot about autonomy of the patients, but no one talks about the autonomy uh, that extends to the surgeon as well as the patient. Uh, we really uh, should not be forced to perform surgery that we think is futile, and yet uh, many of us do. The surgeon uh, stays, I hope, as part of the palliative care team. Uh, it's changing because we actually know the patients and the families uh, sometimes more than the primary care uh, because we spend more time with them, especially under stressful uh, conditions. We are the ones who have to guide patients and families to these uh, appropriate decisions uh, in their care, perhaps even for generations, if these are genetically based problems that they have. I, uh, with respect to uh, many of my colleagues, uh, I say that no one or few can understand the anxiety of going to bed at night uh, and realizing what we have to do in the morning if we're facing a horrendous, uh, life-threatening operation. I do make the point that I don't think anyone can identify with the situation in the operating room when we burn the bridge. Uh, and we can't go forward, but we can't go backward, but the end isn't in sight. This is what I think uh, uh, engenders bad behavior. I think in many cases we're just terrified. And yet we do stand by uh, allowing the community, our students, our non-surgical colleagues to perpetuate the myth uh, that we're only technicians. Uh, I'm honored to be back at the McLean Center and with, uh, with Mark and, and my teachers here. I feel like, this, like the oldest student you've ever had standing up in front of you. Uh, but they were fun in the early days when I said there were ethical challenges in surgery and eyes would roll back. And then we had the Lantos revelation when John came uh, to visit us and you do ethics pizza rounds for the surgery service. He insisted that the medical house staff be there as well as the uh, surgery house staff. He presented the challenge to the medical house staff first of a patient who comes into the emergency room, uh, severe myocardial infarction, hypotensive, no matter what was done when the patient got to the intensive care unit, uh, he couldn't be saved and he died. How many of you felt responsible? No one. He presented the scenario to the surgery house staff. The patient comes in with a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, hypotensive. You've been in the operating room for six hours trying to save the life. You get the patient to your intensive care unit. You stay up all night with the patient and the patient dies. How many of you feel responsible? Everyone. The difference, the difference was stunning. But now there's a threat uh, to their, our cherished relationship because medicine has become a business. Time is money. Reimbursement is down. So theoretically, we need to see more patients to generate the same income. It's frustrating because we can't actually do more now uh, than ever before. 
So in many cases, we try to do it for as many people as possible. Plus, too many of my colleagues uh, in surgery, this was alluded to yesterday, respond to the business model. There's a shift in attitude within the profession. Business jargon has become commonplace. Patients are replaced by consumers. Eventually, they become customers. Patients were treated like family members. Customers come to your business to purchase health care. And the less time you spend with customers, the better your bottom line. It's difficult to demonstrate that restoring the doctor-patient relationship is going to save money for the business. So who supports the surgeon? Where do we find help? We have our personal values. Our mentor system is corrupted by the reduced working hours and the less time we spend with our mentors. Uh, we have advice and stories from respected individuals. And as I'm going to finish the rest of my talk, we go to literature and history. If we were really good, we would create and participate in an effective support system uh, for our trainees and ourselves, but that's for the future. So I'm going to refer to a, a mentor and teacher, Tom Trizic, who spent uh, much time here at the University of Chicago, and I'm going to his uh, ethics lecture presented to the College of Surgeons in 2001. He starts stating that four surgeons committed suicide in one year. They were all fellows of the college. They were all involved in academic medicine and were considered successful. How utterly complete was their impairment? That surgery itself might be an impairing profession is a troubling thought. And he made the point, we may not be as supportive of each other as we think we are. Perhaps the very profession of surgery may be impaired. He defines impairment as an impaired surgeon as one who for physical or psychological reasons is no longer capable of performing in a professionally safe fashion. Our standards are high. Injuries and age-related problems may be of little consequence in non-surgical specialties, but can significantly impair and incapacitate surgeons. Significantly, we tolerate such problems poorly. Our bar of safety uh, for surgical performance is set high. Complications and problems are easily identified. We work in a very public environment. Accusations are too easily made. The challenge is to measure and evaluate competence before preventable complications occur. He goes on to say impairment is, is a secret sickness. Impairment from alcohol and drugs associated with higher incidence of mental illness, divorce, accident, premature mortality, and suicide, as he states among his four friends. Are we an impaired profession? It's one whose virtues of courage, veracity, fidelity, dedication, including the social virtue of caring, are threatened by external goods of power, prestige, and money, and whose identified purpose fails to unite its members. He states, if surgeons don't function with a unity of vision or spirit of caring for each other, the profession is fostering the growth of impairment. In the 50s and 60s, it got worse with third parties and Medicare as they established an unfortunate expectation of fee for service. Dr. Krisik makes the point, how does an individual or society value the special skills available nowhere else that make the difference in life and death? And yet we run the risk of exchanging virtue and respect for money. The most impairing facts of our profession, he says, have become that we've become rich. We expect to be rich, and society does not highly regard the rich unless you're a sports figure or a rock star. He faces the crisis of decreasing compensation and inflating expectations. The major battle has become financial. If you look at the, the life, the productive life of a surgeon, uh, we begin practice at age 30 to 35 years, and we quit 22 years later a tragic waste of resources for society and for surgery. External goods threaten virtuous and caring behavior. He makes the strong point, academic surgery is dog-eat-dog, -dog, but he clarifies it that private practice is the opposite. <laughs> he goes on to imply that the seeds of impairment are sown in the educational process. When we seek surgeons, we look for those with intensity and drive, but not too intense and not too much drive and not too ingratiating. 
It's difficult to predict who will handle the potentially impairing stress. Surgery is supposed to be different. There's problems with workload, changes in the doctor-patient relationship, and diminishing reimbursement. Still, the excitement of surgery and performing operations seems to be no less intense. He claims it can even be seductive. He goes on to describe the good role model, our mentors, who stresses the ability to be humane as a key of the profession of surgery. They teach us to handle the experiences that change us. None are abusive or harassing or impaired or impairing. But yet, if you look at the negative role model, this person may be abusive, harassing, or themselves exhibit a form of behavior or personality impairment. The result in a hostile working environment inside and outside the operating room, particularly true when there's a power differential and when women trainees are placed at risk. And yet, Others see these as often high-performing, competitive, successful in academic and financial areas, and in fact can be seen by others as entertaining and charismatic. He finishes by saying that mistakes are impairing. There's no greater challenge to us than how we handle mistakes. Public disclosure is a serious ethical issue. Anticipation of silence, disapproval, or litigation precludes wide disclosure and truth-telling. It's profoundly human to seek forgiveness, and yet too often in our profession, uh, there's no place where we can actually ask for forgiveness. If you look at the support systems, usually there's 20 people for the average person in society, friends, relatives, and neighbors. It drops critically in the first year of surgery residency. There's a non-human part of the time, usually a cat or a goldfish. It never returns to the level that many people in the rest of society enjoy. Surgery is competitive and can be a very solitary profession. Unidentified colleagues are presumed to be sharks until proven otherwise. We're advised not to bleed because it attracts sharks. And we're advised to get out of the water if someone else is bleeding. He finishes by suggesting that perhaps we should choose uh, the middle path, as taught by Buddha. Like the Buddha, we are early exposed to old age, illness, poverty, blood, pain, and death. And we can never go home again once we've seen these images. We become joined with humanity in ways that others cannot be. To find the way, one must be guided by a master, by our mentors. Just as we learn virtue and caring, we can learn how to apply ethics and morality to the, plastic, to the practice of surgery. He finishes, surgery may be an impairing profession in many ways, but it doesn't have to be. Thank you.